Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to Ledger Open. My name is Moel Said, and I'll be here with you today to discuss a pretty interesting topic, one that I really like, tokenized communities with a very special guests. We'll be diving with much more things than tokenized communities, actually, because our guest today is Trevor McFedries. Trevor is someone who thrives at the intersection of different worlds, uh, producing uniquely creative and often futuristic projects. He is the founder and CEO of Brud, uh, the media and technology company that created Lil Michela, the digital influencer, which I'm sure most of you probably know. Uh, but that's not all, actually, because Trevor is full on Web3. A year ago, he created Friends with Benefits, a token gated cultural DAO, and he recently became the CEO of Dapper Collectives. Ladies and gentlemen, Trevor McFedries. Oh. That was a lovely intro, thank you. <laughs> Hope I was up to it. Oh, so let's start from the beginning. Sure. Um, you know, every year there's something new happening in crypto. 2020 was the year of DeFi. 2021 is clearly the year of NFTs, DAOs, and of course the metaverse. Sure. And somehow, somehow your different projects found themselves right at the middle of these trends. So could you maybe start by uh, giving us a quick overview of your creative vision for creative storytelling and where it intersects with technology and community building? Certainly, yeah. I mean, I was talking to someone this morning, I feel like I've been pushing this like metaverse virtual economies rock up a hill for like five plus years. And now we're here and I'm exhausted, but I'm excited by all the energy. Uh, I view all of us as storytellers, right? I think for the last 15 plus years, we've been telling our own stories in these very fragmented ways. So um, I often use someone like Zion Williamson or LeBron James, a basketball player everyone knows, as someone who have told their stories on Sports Illustrated magazine covers, in YouTube videos, Instagram posts, Facebook, whatever it is. And there effectively is this, this, this canon, this story, that's being told in non-linear ways. Um, I spent a lot of time with little Michaela telling stories in nonlinear ways. And I think of you know, the blockchain as an opportunity to create a canon in a linear way that has provenance. And so when you view all of us as storytellers, you have an opportunity to leverage uh, uh, the blockchain and emer emergent uh, platforms or applications to kind of aggregate that and tell it in a, in a place where everyone can view it, understand it, and potentially allow you to build an economy around it. Yeah, and speaking of Lil Michaela, so you created Lil Michaela in 2016? Yes. Seems in hindsight, crazy. it is super relevant, but I think back in the day it did raise some eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> how did that idea come to life, and how will Lil Michaela be transitioning from Web 2 to Web 3? Yeah, I mean, I could probably fill up the whole session as to how it came to life, but I think the long and short of it was uh, I'm at my core most interested in trying to see to it that innovative people, people that come up with new ideas, realize the, the upside and value of those ideas. I, I think there was a ton of friction in being a public figure, a public artist. Uh, I was, uh, you know, long story short, a software engineer that became a recording artist and put out a top 10 album and knew all the pains of being in the public eye and thought there was an opportunity to create effectively like a, a heat shield and also a vehicle for creative talent. Um, if you had a, a writer, uh, you know, a, a comedy writer and a choreographer or a stylist, is there a way for them to put their talents through a vehicle such that the sum of their parts can be bigger of them individually? And that could be this kind of virtual celebrity. Beyond that, I imagined a kind of a, an emergent metaverse that wasn't world-centric. We often hear of like the Ready Player One where there's an emergent world and you step into it. I thought it actually would be like personality or kind of character-centric where uh, it's, I always kind of explain like walking into a restaurant. Imagine you've never been to a restaurant before. That's why you have a host there to be like, hey, welcome. You can take a seat here. Restrooms are over there. Here's a menu. You know, walking into like an, an emergent metaverse, if you saw a familiar face, a bridge between Web 2 and, and that space, um, perhaps you could better understand it and navigate it. And so that was really the kind of the, the dream and impetus for starting Little Michaela and, and Bride, which is kind of like a, a modern Disney in our heads. Um, but the way it's changing is that we were really focused on kind of proving this model out and trying to build decentralized celebrity. So a celebrity with different, you know, uh, individuals kind of driving that celebrity. And a logical next step was to create a decentralized organization. Um, so imagining a world where Spider-Man is community owned. Uh, 
governance tokens are being used to make decisions for that character. Um, you know, the IP is, is open sourced and the community is getting incentivized to create that media and participating in the revenue that comes from that media being sold as non-fungible tokens. And so that is uh, the long and short of where, we, where we've been and where we're headed. Super interesting. And we, we'll be diving into that in a minute. But first, I want to speak about Brud. Uh, so uh, your company was recently acquired by Dapper Collectives. Uh, Dapper Labs, yeah, and you yeah. became CEO uh, of Dapper Collectives, which is um, an organization that specializes in mainstreaming DAOs. Uh, so that's one more uh, responsibility to your long <laughs> list of responsibilities. Uh, what's that all about? Oh, it's a great question. I mean, A, we were, you know, heads down focused on decentralizing bread. Uh, I've known Roham at, at Dapper for a very long time, and I often joke that like, I would try to set up my fundraising uh, processes around his. So when I was going trying to fundra fundraise for like fake humans on the internet, I could go after the guy who was like selling pictures of cats on the internet. We were kind of the, the crazy folks doing stuff that didn't make a ton of sense in, in 2016, 2017, or whatever it was. Um, but, but you know, I think as far as kind of managing all the responsibilities, I think like I've had to hire quite well, and I think identify people that are quite special. Later on, Alex Yang and Dexter from Friends of Benefits are going to be speaking, and like people are always like, how do you do it all? And the, re the reality is I don't do it all. I, I gave, a, I mean, almost all of, 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 the, of the praise to Alex and the, and the FWB DAO and team for realizing a lot of the things that I just kind of started on a weekend and handed off to these special folks. And, you know, Nicole, Isaac, part of my team at Brud and Dabra Collectives and have been a part for a very long time, have really taken this, this little seedling of an idea and brought it to life. Okay. And What's that going to change for Broad in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think we've got, I, we kind of do these zero to one crazy things where we're, we're first through the door and catch all the arrows, but we have a lot of question marks, right? Um, there obviously is kind of a black mirror dystopia where you open source an incredible piece of IP and people do all kinds of terrible things with it. You know, anything you can, it's the internet. Terrible things are going to happen. But we think there's an opportunity to also enable that hive mind and that brain trust to do really special things. Um, when, I, when I was first kind of getting started in this bread journey, I had the opportunity to work with J.J. Abrams. And I remember them kind of scheming on Star Wars stuff and being shocked that a lot of people in the Star Wars, on Star Wars team or at Disney, were have to call super fans because the fans knew more about the Star Wars IP than they did. And so I think there's an opportunity to break down those silos between fandoms and creators and bring them together to create media that we all love and I think that can like further the cause that we all care about. That's awesome. And speaking of DAOs, it's actually impossible to speak of DAOs without you know, mentioning Friends with Benefits, uh, which is one of the hottest projects of the year. Um, how did that idea come to life? Oh man, this is, I feel like my life is still with like half-baked silly ideas that lead me to stage talking about something called Friends with Benefits. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, so the reality is I, I've been in, in crypto for a very long time. And, this might offend like Bitcoin maximalists in, in, in the crowd right now, but most of my friends, my, my kind of day-to-day -day friends are kind of lefty collectivists, you know, art school pseudo intellectuals that were quite turned off by this idea of like a hyper-capitalist, you know, Bitcoin maximalist seasteading future. It, it wasn't very sexy. And I thought there was kind of an emergent collectivist future that was being born out of Ethereum. And the opportunity to show them what Web3 could look like, that there at once was this vision of, of a world where value accrued to the edges of a network and then it became centralized and was really all that they knew. And so you had this like, giant fear of obviously big finance because of 2008 and other things, but also a big fear of big tech because they've had their audiences gated. And the idea of combining them was terrifying. And so Friends of Benefits was really a simple uh, way for me to kind of show them the upside of uh, you know, a DAO collectivism and uh, you know, what tokens can mean for representing value and for sharing value in people that, 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 that kind of create all the value in a network. And if helpful, we can kind of explain what Friends of Benefits is if people don't know. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, the, the really kind of simple and I think like lame way to describe it is kind of a token gated community, like a Soho house on chain. Um, we describe it much more like a city, right? And in order to access that city, you need to own a certain amount of tokens. Um, we created a fixed amount of tokens. And so as a result, as you create more value in these token gated discords or in these token gated live events, 
uh, there becomes more demand on those fixed set of tokens. And you see the value that you're creating reflected in those tokens that you're holding. And so instead of paying a fee to Soho House, you're effectively just holding or staking your tokens and then contributing value that's reflected in that. And so people have seen you know, token prices appreciate and they've had a lot of fun. And I think in that process, things start to click that holy cow, this token thing can be quite powerful. Absolutely, and this whole concept of shared ownership of ideas and outcome is super interesting. How do you see that evolving in the next few years? Because for now, it's a token-gated social DAO on Discord, but I'm sure you have ideas for the future. Yeah, I've got plenty, but what's, be what's brilliant, I mean, we, we, um, we've been talking to in in investors that wanted to invest in, in our DAO. And another amazing thing about that is I've kind of lived in this authoritarian Web2 CEO world where I say whatever I want and that happens. But the beauty of a DAO is investors wanted to invest and we had to go to our community and say, this, you guys own this thing, like, do you want that? And, you know, VCs had to pitch our community, which is incredible. But that also speaks to, to, the, to the beauty of what a DAO is, right? I, um, I've often said that, like, Web 2 was about creating a product and then building a community. Web 3 is about building a community, listening to that community, and then realizing those products. And it kind of inverts the model. And so while I have a ton of ideas, you know, I can draft them up in the Discord, but the reality is that the community brings these things to life. Uh, Art Basel was just in Miami, and uh, you know, we threw an incredible event with Eric Abadu and Azealia Banks, and you know, I think like 1,100 people, 1,200 people, and people were like, you, wait, you did it. I'm like, I did nothing. <laughs> you know, these incredible food and beverage people, events producers in the community put it together, and it felt like a mini festival. So what I try to do is just shepherd with some thoughts. Um, Alex, Dexter, Patty, uh, you know, the whole crew, they, they really kind of try to shepherd it as well, but the community brings it to life. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned something earlier about you know the emergence of decentralized uh, entertainment franchises, uh, and with the you know rapid adoption of NFTs, avatars, and everything that we've been seeing this year, uh, it is starting to seem like the future could have a decentralized Marvel or Disney where people own the IP. But how how do you actually see this coming to life? And if you look at the at the current ecosystem. Where do you think it's going to pop up first? Uh, that's a really great question. I mean, the reality is there's going to be a ton of challenges, right? I, I think I've seen enough of, the, of these bull markets that you recognize that a lot of the excitement gets drained out in a bear market. Yeah. And, you know, we're seeing challenges with DAOs now. I and mean, uh, those of you in DeFi and following the sushi stuff, there, there are real challenges to making this stuff work long term. But what we've tried to do is just optimize for having really smart, thoughtful people and paying attention to all of these little petri dishes of governance that are springing up all around us. Um, as to how I think the kind of like future Marvel, you know, will be realized, I think there's a, there's a really big chance that we'll see a bottoms up success in, in gaming or in media. I think trying to decentralize top down is a little tricky. Um, we kind of have an architecture at, at Dapper Collectives or at Brud that allows us to do so, but I think taking some of these, these big legacy IPs will be difficult. You, you saw some seedlings with stuff like what Dom did with loot where it's like, hey, here's a piece. Let's all come together and realize it. I think that kind of composable narrative media piece is going to be very important. And I think because you know where, where we find a lot of pain in, in the kind of Web two ecosystem stuff like journalism, you know, where it's been very difficult to run a, a, a Web two media business where you're putting out news. I think there's a lot of opportunity in Web three to refine those models, and so you're going to see a lot of excitement there that could help pave the way. Okay. And when you think about the future, what excites you the most? I mean, it, it's so corny and cliche, but I think there is a future where people who create a lot of the value in our lives, I think if you were to start from first principles and say, what makes life worth living? It's probably not like financial derivatives, but they capture a lot of the value in, in this world of ours. If you were to kind of stop and say like, man, music, fashion, art, uh, those things I think are just now starting to see a small fraction of, of what they deserve. And it feels crazy to all of us who have lived in the culture industry for you know, 20 plus years to see a JPEG sell for half a million dollars. But you know, a hotline bling Drake dance gif is pretty freaking powerful and impactful and important. And I think it's just starting to realize a small portion of what it's deserved. All right, what about the things that worry you? Oh, the things that worry me. I mean, like decentralization and you know, immutable, uh, an immutable future and such a proof future obviously has all kinds of caveats. I think um, you know, I am really intrigued by this idea of what I call capital as a weapon. 
um, you know, in the States for all, you know, all through, through COVID, we woke up to Donald Trump responding to the stock market in real time, right? And kind of creating policy around that. Whereas democracy is often this lagging indicator where you know, every four years we get to go give them an opinion on how we feel about them. I think when you start to create instruments that can be monitored in real time and you attach capital and smart contracts to those things, you can imagine a world where you know, uh, we all come together and instead of raising money to buy the constitution, we put $45 million in a smart contract that says, hey, you know, politician X, if you don't hit um, you know, certain carbon emission targets, those funds flow to your competitor. And if you do hit carbon emission targets, those funds flow to you to be reelected. And all of a sudden, we get to bully people the way financial markets have bullied all of us for decades. The flip side of that is like really powerful folks leveraging their capital in, in, in new and novel ways where we kind of can have we can see this outsized uh, input on our daily lives. And so there's trade-offs with technology always. I think I'm really excited. I try to be an optimist, but you know, it's, it's quite easy to, to, to figure out pessimistic takes as well. Yeah, of course. And before we move on to Q&A, uh, what can you tell us about your future milestones? What's the, what's the new thing you're working on? Uh, you know, I think uh, major challenges for myself and my team are, are figuring out how to create user experiences that are familiar and accessible. Um, I've been spending a lot of time with, with people like my friend Thais Klepish in the crowd, who's really great at messaging and figuring out how to, uh, how, how to communicate what we're doing to young people especially. Uh, but I think that's a major challenge. This stuff is really dense. You know, we're talking about keys and contracts and all of these big words that don't necessarily, uh, you know, translate well, let alone connect to people who are interested in just trying to better their lives that are already complicated. And so I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how we can make this stuff mainstream, as cliche as that is, you know, open up all of this opportunity to people all around the world. And to make this stuff mainstream, if you had to choose one thing that we all had to do here in the room, what would it be? I mean, I'm a big fan of this kind of each one teach one thing. I think it's, it's what's made Web3 so sticky. Um, I often talk about the, the user interface experience of something like a, a MetaMask being quite clumsy and difficult, but that also being one of its superpowers, much the way Snapchat was really difficult for parents to understand. You kind of create this nice little club where you're like, no, 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 come over to my house, I'll walk you through this thing. And I want to keep that, that, that sense of community and that, that sticky factor, but also make it easier for people to prevent things like hacks and from having their walls liquidated and some of those things that can really leave a, a sour taste in your mouth. And so that's top of mind. But man, there are so many challenges and I'm, I'm really lucky to be tackling all these things with like the giga brains that I see in the crowd right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's kind of the perfect way to end it. We'll be moving on to Q&A. So uh, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand and someone from the lovely people here will be handing you out a mic. Any questions? I know it's early. Yeah. Shouldn't, shouldn't be shy. Hey, hey all right. We've got, got someone <laughs> right there. Mike? Yeah. yeah, I can't without a microphone. Okay. Perfect. I think that's a very good question to paraphrase so we have it on the mic. Uh, oftentimes in Web3, you'll have situations where you effectively have one token, one vote. So if you have a lot of wealth, you can accrue a lot of votes and you can you know, skew proposals or the directions of a DAO or an organization such that you create the best economic outcome for yourself. 
that may not be in the best interest of the protocol for, or for, for all of us. And so how do you think long-term and how do you kind of solve for that dilemma? I think that you know, one of the things that I'm most excited by is all the experimentation and governance. Uh, even at Friends with Benefits, you know, we've done uh, votes where it's, it's one, one address one vote. And so um, that runs into Sybil issues and, you know, how do you verify that one person doesn't have a thousand wallets or all of these things. But uh, those are all kind of being solved for. I think we, can all, we often joke that we're kind of speed running the history of Wall Street and the history of governance. But one of the beauties of that is there are lots of strange experiments and checks and balances that can hopefully create uh, scenarios such that we can solve for those things. Um, you know, all kinds of headaches in DeFi and now with, you know, billions of, of, of value locked in these contracts. There's a lot of pressure to solve these things the right way. And so I definitely don't have the answers, but I'm hoping that somebody out there does. Great question. We've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Sure. It's another like really great question. Um, did I didn't bump my mic, pardon me. That's a great question. And just to, to, to paraphrase it once more, uh, you, you have the, the kind of the same challenges you see in the real world with voting in DAOs. So there are, there are, there are DAOs like a Compound or Uniswap that have millions of users and oftentimes have proposals where a very small fraction, thousand, maybe more people will vote on them. Um, again, we see that playing out in the real world. We have really low voting turnout in the States. Uh, and, and we've tried to incentivize that at, at Friends with Benefits by trying to you know, engage in people. Um, I probably will say Alex and Dexter's, Dexter's name too much, but you know, weekly town halls, trying to communicate things and why they're important to people is really important. And as a result, we've had pretty good turnout. But I think you know, the reality is oftentimes in, in any of these communities, we talk about this kind of 99-1 where 90% of people are going to like passively sit back and kind of freeload or engage you know, uh, in, in the kind of day-to-day -day stuff that, that kind of brings them immediate satisfaction. 9% you know, may come and get involved in some of the decision making, but really 1% are gonna do a, most of the work. And so we tried to expand that, but again, like, don't know that we have the answers. I think what we've tried to do is communicate things as clearly as possible as to why they're important and why you should care about them and hope people raise their hand and want to participate. But this is all of the stuff that is kind of human nature and really difficult to solve. It's, 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 it's Moloch, right? Like human coordination and kind of getting humans to do things is why we're all in this game. Absolutely. One last question. Anyone? Sure. How we can force what? I'm sorry? How you can prevent the centralization Yeah, that's a great question. It's similar to that first question. You know, how do you stop the centralization of power inside of an organization if you can just purchase tokens and, 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 and kind of like a, usually kind of like um, you know, outvote people in a proposal. I think what we've tried to do in the past is, is literally do a thing where even if you have, a, you know, 10,000 tokens in one wallet, that one wallet is only worth one vote. And so it's similar to what you, you, you see in the States, one person, one vote. That said, there are ways to, to wage war with that capital, right? Um, you've seen a lot of things in DeFi, uh, if, if you check out Curve, kind of one of the back, back, backbones and bribes and some of these like third party applications that are allowing you to rent out your votes to do things, it's, it's going to be extremely complicated. I think the best thing you can do, in, in my opinion, is try to have a community that's actively engaged and paying attention. In DeFi, because there is so much capital at stake, you've seen there be checks and balances. People are diving into you know, the ether scan or on the chain trying to see what's happening. Uh, they're doing their best to, to make sense of what's uh, currently happening and then trying to act as, as backstops or checks. But the reality is like this stuff is super tricky. Uh, people often describe it as a dark forest where there are, there are these mercenary figures out there lurking at every turn trying to extract value from you. And, and, and we're trying to figure out uh, kind of preventative measures to protect people and protect communities. But it really is this cat and mouse game. Trevor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leisure. Fantastic. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Big hand for Trevor McFedries.